It is good to see you tonight. Uh, we are going to turn our attention to our study in Psalm 119. And we are at the next, I think this is the 11th letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So we're midway through. There's 22 letters. And this is the Hebrew letter Kaf. And we begin reading here in verse 81. This is kind of the low point of the psalm and for the psalmist. It says, My soul faints for your salvation, but I hope in your word. My eyes fail from searching your word, saying, When will you comfort me? For I have become like a wineskin in smoke. Yet I do not forget your statutes. How many are the days of your servant? When will you execute judgment on those who persecute me? The proud have dug pits for me, which is not according to your law. All your commandments are faithful. They persecute me wrongfully. Help me. They almost made an end of me on earth, but I did not forsake your precepts. Revive me according to your loving kindness, so that I may keep the testimony of your mouth. So the title comes from verse 83 here of our devotional this evening, Wineskin in Smoke. It's kind of an unusual uh, bit of imagery in the psalm. Do you feel like a wineskin in smoke? You might be saying, well, I'm not sure. <laughs> what does that feel like exactly? Well, that's a great question. It, I'll tell you this, it's not a good feeling. I can get that from the context. It's not something I want happening in my life. A wineskin and smoke means I'm in distress because that's what the psalmist is saying. I'm struggling. A wineskin is something that is only useful when it's pliable. It's only useful uh, to be filled with liquids if, if it has some elasticity to it, if it's uh, kind of old and dried up and shriveled and hardened and tough, you know, like an old piece of leather, then you're, you're not, it's not going to be useful for much. So that's the idea, I think, of a wineskin and smoke. It's the idea of just being unusable, being toughened and hardened. And so that's what we see in Psalm 119. This is a lament. And he, he has gotten to the point where he's telling us, that's it. I'm used up. This is a big struggle for me. And, of course, he's venting his feelings because we never reach the end of... If we're still living and breathing, God can use us and he can revive us. Of course, that's what the, the, the psalmist wants here. Now, notice what he says, though, when he's venting these feelings. He says, my soul faints and my eyes fail me. His eyes fail him for a good reason. His soul is fainting because of everything that he is going through, but he doesn't forget the words of God. That's why his eyes fail him. He's constantly searching. You know, maybe he didn't have glasses. You know, <laughs> we read a lot and our eyes get strained and uh, we need some glasses. And so I think that's the figure here. You can't forget the words of God when you're going through persecution. And he's reminding God that I haven't forgotten. And remember, Lord, that everyone that is persecuting me, they are the ones in the wrong. I'm not in the wrong here. I'm doing what is right because I'm in your word. They've almost taken his life, it says in the psalm. But he stands on the words of God, whether they're commandments or statutes or whatever way they're articulated here. We're talking about the words of God. And you say, well, what motivates this man? Well, it's not self-preservation. Isn't that surprising? Because that's what most people say. They just want to hang on. And the idea you get from people when you're talking to them, they want to hang on because they want life to be better for them. But the psalmist isn't thinking that way. And he certainly isn't lying. You know, this is when when the when we get to the end of this section, there's a turn that's going to take place. He's not in it for self-preservation. He's in it for personal revival, yes. But that revival, he wants it to take place so that he can be a testimony of these words. He wants to be a testimony of God's grace. And so that's what's going on here. He wants to reflect the righteousness of God for the glory of God to the world at large. That's the goal of the psalmist and that should be the goal of every Christian. All of us should have that kind of mindset. And so the wine, skin, and smoke 
just pictures the internal suffering that he's certainly going through. This is life when it strikes a minor chord. And all through the psalm, we've noted times when the psalmist has gone through this internal battle. Every single section, there is mention of it. And, and so, you know, when you read Psalm 119, how, how often have you heard this idea? And I'm glad that we're going through section by section because we can obliterate this idea. You kind of get the idea that when you go through the psalm, every time the psalmist uh, speaks in the psalm, every verse has to do with the word of God, and people are just kind of taking a wooden or plastic view of the psalm. Like he's always in the right place because he's always in the word. But he's always in the word, and he doesn't ever seem to be in the right place. <laughs> and that's more reminiscent of my life than this idea of always having this you know, continual euphoria and, well, you know, you, you work yourself up to play the role you know you should, should play. Well, the psalmist isn't going to do that. He's going to be very genuine. He's talking about life as it is. It's difficult. It's troubling. It's painful. And it's dangerous. And I'm constantly under this threatening, chastening, or judgment of God for the way that I'm living. And the way that I'm living is just a reflection of what's going on inside of me. And that's what he's saying. So we can relate to that. We, we find it difficult as well. We find life troubling as well. And we see all of the pain and, and the threatening of God's judgment and, and certainly the danger that we face in life. So we want to pinpoint these two great struggles that the psalmist is going through. The first struggle is the struggle with ourselves. But then the second struggle is the struggle with others. When I say the struggle with ourselves, I'm talking about the idea of knowing because we're in God's word, right? This is only when it happens. We're in God's word and because of the light we're receiving, we know what we deserve. This idea of judgment, it looms over us. God is peeling back the layers and he's showing us what we really are. That's the struggle within. And then there's this struggle that we have with others because other people cause us pain and, and suffering in life. That's the sinfulness of others that is coming against us. So all the trials and, and the difficulties because of things that are within are complicated because of the things that are without too. And it's kind of a double whammy. So what do we say? Well, we say there's, there's something wrong in me, if I can simplify it. And we know what that is, of course. It's my sin nature. There's something wrong in me. But then there's something that is wrong that happens to me. Okay? So it's not only is there something wrong with me, but wrong things are happening to me. And sometimes wrong things are happening to me wrongfully, like the psalmist says here. So both of these facts remind us of the, of the uh, desperation, of the pain that we feel, uh, of the shame and the death that is the result of sin. We need to speak to God about both of those things. About the things that are going on inside of us, but also about the things that are happening to us. When I talk to people, and I've done this myself too, I'm not, I'm not saying that I've escaped this, you get the idea that almost everything negative in their lives happens to them because it happens to them. It's not coming from within their own sinful nature. They're not the ones causing complications in their lives. If it was up to them, things would be great. But that's not true. Okay, the problem is in you and the problem is happening to you at the same time. And until you come to the uh, end of yourself and realize that, you're not going to get better. Solomon wrote this in Ecclesiastes 9.3. I have it up here on the screen. This is an evil in all that is done under the sun. The one, that one thing happens to all, he says. Truly, the hearts of the sons of men are full of evil. That's you and that's me. Our hearts are full of evil. Madness is in their hearts while they live. Have you ever felt like that? Madness is in my heart. How could I do this again? Or uh, how, how could I be thinking this way after such a high spiritually? Madness is in my heart, right? That's how we feel. Um, and then after, uh, after that, they go to the dead. Ecclesiastes <laughs> 9 and verse 3. Not a very happy verse, but it's certainly reality. 
So there are two things that I'd like us to focus on as we come at this particular section in Psalm 119 tonight. And the two things are, of course, evil that's coming out of us and then evil that's coming at us. Let's look at the evil that's coming out of us first, which I think is a good idea. Anyone who reads the Word of God regularly wouldn't even dare to dispute this fact. But, but sometimes when you say it and people are not in the Word, they say, there's no evil coming out of me, as if they've somehow escaped the idea of evil. I mean, saved people start to think that way. I can't be evil, I'm a saved person. No, you can be evil. And when you're a saved person and evil is coming out of you, that's pretty bad. It's a poor reflection on your Savior, and that's the problem. The more we know the words of God, the more aware we become of our own sinfulness. And it's absolutely devastating. It really is. I mean, it's devastating for me to confront me and to see who I really am. Uh, the light of the world, the Lord Jesus, makes my darkness really, really dark. And so when that happens, it becomes very, very painful. All throughout the psalm, we're made aware of the psalmist's shame and guilt, and then we're reminded of our own shame and guilt. How many times have we read through the psalm section here in Psalm 119, we thought to ourselves, yeah, yeah, shame. He talks about shame and how he doesn't want it to be found out. And we, th we felt that way, at least I felt that way. How, how can we avoid the shame when we're confronted by the light of God's word? We can't avoid it. And yet there's something inside of us where we don't want it to be made known. We know our besetting sins. We just don't want others to know about them. And we somehow have deluded ourselves into thinking that God doesn't know about them either. We see the threat of judgment or of chastening coming upon us, but that doesn't seem to be stopping us from doing what we know we shouldn't do. So we've all gone astray like lost sheep. And I'm not quoting just from Isaiah there. This is the last verse of the psalm. Way, way down in verse 176. Uh, we cling to his words, even so. Uh, we suffer in the stew of our own sinfulness. That's the idea there in that last verse. And we long for God to comfort us again. And so we say what the psalmist says here in verse 82. When will you comfort me again? That's a great question. We feel like it's never going to come. When you talk to people that are really deeply depressed, they don't ever think that they're ever going to be comforted that they're ever going to be lifted out of this, that they're ever going to experience personal revival. And sometimes that stops them from taking the first step that they need to take and deepen that exposure so that they can gain hope. It's just amazing. So we need God to revive us according to his loving, loving kindness there in verse 88. So the evil coming out of us is frightening in the light of God's words at least. We wonder if the Lord will forsake us. We wonder if we will wander away from the Lord. All of these questions, they're really penetrating when you think about them. Or, or this question here, will God leave me accursed? Will, will God chasten me in such a way where I'll just be this old wineskin in smoke and be completely unuseful uh, to him or to anyone else in, 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 in the temporal realm? Will our shame and our guilt be exposed in the light of day so that other people will see it and look upon it and avoid us? Will the things of this world continue to hold sway over us so that we are paralyzed spiritually because we care more about the things of the world than we care about the things of God? Will we continue in sin? You know, that's a that's a question Paul asks in the great sanctification chapter of Romans 6. Will we continue in sin that grace may abound? Well, certainly not. But we wonder. We wonder about it sometimes. Will sin continue to rule over us? Do we view ourselves as dross or chaff in the Bible, used up and spent, and God will just, and we're gone? Are we going to be consumed by depression? Or are we going to live with this fear instead of being filled with purpose from God and, and knowing joy once again. We don't ever think that we're going to see the other side of things. What will happen as I approach the end of my life? Have you thought about that? Will I be ready for it? Will I feel blessed and at peace when I leave this earth? Or, or will I be tied up in knots feeling 
forsaken and forgotten, even though I know that's not true. And yet I feel that way. I, I know people that are saved, but they feel like they're lost. We, we all ask these questions, and we know that this evil is coming out of us. That's evil, and it's coming out of us. Second, there is evil that's coming at us. Evil that's coming at us. Of course, this is something that happens to us. This is something that there's no way we can avoid it. Uh, you know, it, it's coming. Once we're in the Word, and the Word is in us, we're going to become really sensitive not only to the sin that is within us, but the sin that is around us. And people in the Word, don't, they don't look at life and, and resign themselves to uh, this, oh, oh well, what can you do attitude. Okay. <laughs> and, and yet people, that, that's how they behave. We can't stop life and say, oh, well, what, what can you do? There's not much you can do about this. Or, or uh, throw a pity party, right? The self-pity that kicks in and, and, and we bemoan the fact that um, things aren't the way that they used to be and we're living in retrospect all the time and, and we wonder if, if, if uh, we'll ever get back to the old days. See, this is a sinful way to live. Amen. See, we know what we face in this world. And we know that the evil is going to come at us full bore. And that hasn't changed. That hasn't changed for 2,000 years plus. It hasn't changed for 6,000 years plus. All right? It has been the same. My soul faints for your deliverance. Your salvation, he says in the psalm. Have you ever taken a section of a psalm and written out in your journal um, a paraphrase to it? That's a great way to go through the Psalms. Here's a paraphrase of the section that we're looking at today that I wrote out for myself. My soul faints for your deliverance from the present world, Lord, but as long as I am alive, I will hope in your word. My eyes fail me and I need glasses because of all the searching I do in your word. I eagerly wait for you to comfort me with all the things that you've promised me. I am like a wineskin in smoke, but I don't forget about your words. I don't forget that you have the power to revive and strengthen me. How many are the days of your servant? How long? It's been too long, Lord. Bring the days of persecution to an end. Let the evil coming at me stop. Look at the proud and arrogant setting their traps and making their accusations against me. Their words are faithless while your words are faithful. They are wrong and evil. You are good and right. Help me. I'm at the end of my rope. They've almost finished me, but I remain in the grip of your grace. I have not forsaken your words. I find hope in them. Revive me in accordance with your great loving kindness toward me and do it for a testimony of your spoken words. Isn't that a great prayer? It just comes from understanding what the psalmist is saying, putting it in your own words, and asking the Lord to bring personal revival into your life. I think that's a good practice to take the scripture, really understand it, assimilate it, chew on it a bit, and then put it out there in your own words. Now, you're not making yourself a translation, of course, but this is a spiritual act. This is something that you're doing as you speak to the Lord and relate to him. So we can look at these verses and we, we can admit that this is rock bottom depression for the psalmist. This is it. And he needs to start climbing out of it. Distress, no strength, vulnerable, fragile. All these words come to mind when we get to this last verse. He's broken. He's contrite. We're in the middle of the psalm. And so the psalmist is going to change direction now. And instead of Pull, pulling out all of the stops and showing God what he fully needs, now he's going to turn the corner and say, I'm going to trust you. He's going to affirm his trust in God. That's what we need to do. We need to stop just bringing these needs before God. We need to affirm our trust in him. That's the idea. That's the evil coming at us. So the evil comes out of us and the evil comes at us. And we are now 
in a place where we know firsthand this evil and what we're capable of. Living in the Word, for me, and I'm sure for you too, doesn't mean you're living above the fray. It means you're in the fray. It means you're doing battle. And for me, what it does is, when I'm living in the fray, it causes me to ask the Lord, how long is this going to go on? It causes me to express to the Lord this fainting of the soul for deliverance. Not just from one thing, but from it all. So that he will lead me in a place of revival. Yeah, clarity, this idea of knowing, it can be really, really painful. But, you know, that's the way pain works. Pain is not something that's pleasant to go through, but it's something that's necessary in life in order to grow and to be better. It teaches us that all is not right with the world and all is not right within. We can't handle the truth. It's a line from a movie that I remember way back. Uh, but we can't. We can't handle the truth. Do you realize that? When the truth exposes us for who we are, it leaves us absolutely devastated. We can't handle the truth. So, you say, well, what does that mean? Ignore the truth? No. It, the truth destroys you, puts that great need within you, and then causes you to look up to God to meet that need. That's what the truth does. I don't want to neglect the truth, but the truth is going to come in, and it is cold, hard steel. It's going to hit me. And then I find behind the truth the love of God. And that strength that God has is matched by that love that God has, and then I'm ready for deliverance. You say, why do I have to be a wineskin in smoke? You have to be a wineskin in smoke so that God can put you in a place of deliverance. Let's pray together.